Hello everyone. Welcome back to Bugbears Out Bugbears and CBS Outreach YouTube channel. And this time we we are back with six, seventh session of our series Weekend Chat with Researchers. And uh, this this will be our last session for this year. And we will be back with new sessions with new people in next year. So. As you all know, Bugbears NCBS is a group at National Center for Biological Sciences. And through this channel, our aim is to do science and research outreach. And we believe that anybody sitting at home can, and can learn science with, with just an electronic device and internet at home. So without further ado, I will just ask Ashwin what our session today is about and who our guest is. Ashwin. So today um, we're going to talk about um, animals doing uh, regenerating themselves. Um, and uh, to talk about this, we have with us uh, Dasarati Palakoleti or Das. Uh, he's a, a faculty at uh, INSTEM and uh, he's been there for 10 years. In fact, Das and I started um, within two months of each other um, on, on the campus. Uh, Das did his um, uh, PhD at ICGB uh, in Delhi and then uh, did his postdoc at uh, the University of um, uh, Connecticut before um, uh, joining um, INSTEM. And in INSTEM, his uh, work primarily deals with this um, fascinating worm called planaria, where, uh, which can basically regenerate anything that you remove of its uh, body. So to talk about uh, planaria and other fantastic animals and cells that regenerate, we have Das. Over to you, Das. Hello, Das. Hi, Nitesh, and hi, Sashwin, and thanks a lot for inviting me here. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really a new thing for me also to come on live stream and talk about the research in interesting ways, what I do. So as a uh, Ashwin has introduced, um, so uh, I mean, I, I, I did my PhD on malarial parasite and then I went and did work on planaria. So when I went to Brent's lab, uh, I went with an idea that I work on Drosophila models uh, to study tissue homeostasis and all that. And then, uh, and then we came across this beautiful paper published by Alejandro and Phil Newmark. Uh, about uh, knocking down genes in this interesting model system called planaria. And that's where we got hooked up and we thought like, okay, look, look, we need to look more into this animal. And that's how we started working on planarian model because of its regeneration capacity. So today, I mean, uh, let me start this session uh, with uh, saying, with sharing my screen about uh, what this model system is all about. And, and what we can learn from this model system, right? So uh, can you see the shared screen? Yes. Yeah. So, so that's like, uh, I've been like promoting um, about this session, like, and we were like, I, I just put up a uh, question for people to guess uh, about like, what are the organisms which can regenerate? And I got uh, uh, examples like starfish, planaria, yeah. And there's like a few wrong answers also. But uh, so how about like just to kickstart this session, like how about to like, tell audience who are like in uh, school, school and colleges yeah. Yeah. about yeah. what regeneration is exactly. Yeah. So let, let's start with the most simplistic definition of um, regeneration. If you go to Google and type this, this is what you get. So uh, it's a, it's a natural process of replacing and restoring damaged are missing cells, tissues, organs, even the entire body parts to full function in both plants and animals. This is the most simplistic definition of um, the regeneration, right? So if you lose, and, and we know that, I mean, uh, we, we get injuries and, and then we, we heal those injuries. And while we are healing, we are also regenerating the tissues that were damaged, right? So, uh, so that's how it is. So what is fascinating now is uh, how does this process work, right? I mean, when I say that uh, I have a damage in a tissue, the tissue should know where the damage is and then, then that's how it has to uh, know where the damage is and then slowly grow back the damaged tissue 
to fully recover the function of the tissue. The, the idea is not just recovering the tissue organ, but also make the organ functional, right? So that's where uh, the interest lies in. That's where it's, it's, it's doing it repeatedly in order to restore the function. So, and it happens, I mean, both in plants as well as in animals. And today we will focus mostly on some of the animal systems that has this immense capacity to regenerate, right? So, uh, so, so that, that's what the simplistic definition of regeneration, right? Yeah. Yes. So, so like, uh, like I just saw this word like replacing and re restoring uh, organs. So, yeah. like just out of curiosity, like uh, we have been uh, seeing Ramayana from a childhood. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is this example of uh, like when Ram uh, cuts off the head of Ravana, and yeah. It, yeah. like it so, just comes back again. Yeah, uh, and that's that's a very interesting point, Nitish. So actually, there are uh, throughout the throughout our. Um, literature, uh, the Hindu literature, not just Hindu literature, also the Western literature or uh, Greek literature. There are many indications of processes of regeneration, right? I mean, I'll just take you through two examples. One is, as you beautifully said, uh, where uh, Ravan with hundred heads and each head you uh, cut off and then it head grows back, right? So, I mean, my, my understanding is, uh, I mean, I don't want to give an opinion back to people who are listening that we know everything. Uh, hum, as a humans, we are always curious, right? And, and, and people have observed these processes because this is all there in your nature. These animals are regenerating in your nature. I mean, I, I think the way humans at that time saw and their perception of regeneration has been put forward that way. So, so I just want to clarify that and take you through a couple of interesting stories in terms of regeneration. So, wait a minute. Yeah. So this is two, two uh, pictures that you see here is right. One, one uh, towards your left side. Uh, this is the avatar of Kali, right? And there is this rakshas called Rakta I mean, uh, Kali went to kill Rakta and uh, whenever she started uh, trying to kill him. Every drop of blood that falls creates another Rakshas out, right? Or creates another Rakta beach. So the way she gets over that is by actually uh, putting her tongue out and uh, cleaning of the blood so that the blood doesn't grow back as Rakta beach. So this is a beautiful concept of a single cell that can potentially give rise uh, to a whole human form, right? Our, our Rakta bead in this case, right? So this is this is a beautiful conceptual representation of um, the process of our regeneration, uh, which I mean, this is, is beautifully determined there. See, the other one comes from the Greek uh, mythology. The person who you see I mean, lying down is Prometheus, right? Uh, so he has been punished by Zeus for stealing the fire and giving it to human civilization. So as a punishment, what uh, he has been tied to the rock and he was asked by the eagle to come and feed on the liver, right? And very interestingly, whenever, because in Greek mythology, liver is considered to be the, the, the storehouse of wisdom. So basically what they're trying to do is the, the eagle comes, lands on him and starts eating the liver bit by bit and then goes away and next day when it comes back, the liver regenerates back, right? So again, it feeds on the liver and goes back. So uh, this is another beautiful representation of uh, an organ that is actually regenerating. Uh, and this is being depicted some, some thousand years back, right? In, in this Greek mythologies. So we have literature. One, one literature we saw is uh, your, uh, your uh, cell making a human form, Rakta beach, and other is an organ regenerating back as it was fed. And Ravan is also a beautiful example of a structural regeneration, right? So where the head has been cut off and then you see the head structures going back. So there are beautiful representation of beautiful concepts that have been put forward in terms of explaining the regeneration here, right? So, uh, so that also brings back to this interesting question, how many types of regenerations could be there, right? Yeah. So that's, that's what, that's what uh, brings us to the next point. We spoke about cell, 
regenerating. We spoke about an organ that's actually regenerating back when eagle feeds. And we know Ravan regenerating the head back. This is structural regeneration. So that brings us to the next question of what are different forms of regeneration, right? So, uh, so as we looked into the mythology and explained different forms of regeneration, and that is what is depicted here. One is cellular regeneration. What you see here is a, is a neuron. And what you see that extension here is an exon. So when so you does. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. Uh, quickly, if I may uh, interrupt, we already, uh, well, we had a couple of questions even before the show started. I think okay. one, uh, the, I think I, we can probably start, take one question to set up a little bit of yeah, context. Please, please. I think and the good. other one is a bit more technical. I think we will get to that a little later. Yeah. So the, the question, this one from Harini is, um, why do only a few animals uh, regenerate? Why don't we hear about all kinds of animals regenerating? Or do all uh, re animals actually regenerate at least a little bit, if not uh, as dramatic as um, uh, some other popular examples like yeah. uh, starfishes? Yeah. I stuff. mean, I had, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful question from Harini uh, Ashwin. It's a very, very good question. Uh, so the way I explain is this. Uh, in a way, Ashwin answered that question, every animal has certain capacity to regenerate, right? Uh, it's just that with time, during evolution, certain animals lost those immense capacity to regenerate. But nonetheless, every animal has certain degree of regeneration capacity, right? So that's how I explain it. So now, as Harini has rightly asked, does every animal regenerate? The answer is yes, but with different capacities. So what happened? The animals that are regenerating either specific tissues or specific organs lost this capacity of regeneration as they evolved. That means as the animals evolved during evolution, right? As the animals evolved from single cell to multicellular uh, to mammalian, uh, evolutions, they lost this capacity to regenerate. So the, now the question is, how did these animals regain that capacity? And what did we lose so that we cannot regenerate as evidently as you see the regeneration ha happening in other animals? So that's the answer to that question, right? So in a nutshell, yes, every animal has the capacity to regenerate to a varying degrees. That's how I'll put it as. And uh, the last questions are uh, coming in already. So yeah. I'm still skipping that one technical question for now. Uh, that's yeah. all from Sonali. We'll get to that uh, later. And she's also asked another question. So is uh, things like chimeras, are these also related to uh, regeneration? Yeah, chimeras. Uh, so, I mean, I put this chimeras as grass things, right? I mean, uh, so uh, again, I mean, planaria and um, hydra. I mean, I'll talk a very little bit about hydra. And um, I mean, Dr. Suren Gaskadbi actually works on Hydra in India. Um, he actually set up the Hydra cultures and he works on it. And, and yes, I mean, you can actually grasp tissues, right? And then from the grafted tissues, you can actually make the regeneration happen. So the answer to that is when we talk about chimeras, I mean, I see chimera as grafting of tissues, right? So when we graft the tissues, we can, actually regenerate them back. Yeah, that's the answer for that. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. excellent. So, so, I mean, I would like to take questions as they come. I mean, so uh, you can interrupt me anytime and, uh, and uh, ask me questions because this is more about an interactive session. So, right. So, yeah. as I flow through, you can stop me and ask me questions. So, uh, so I mean, as we, we talked about types of regenerations, right? I mean, what you see as cellular regeneration, there a neuron, making an axon, if you cut an axon, some of these animals can regenerate that axon back or grow the axon back. It's not actually regeneration, it's growing the axon back. And there is a tissue level regeneration, right? For example, the best example is our skin. We have a skin injury, we can actually grow back the skin. That's a very tissue specific regeneration. And organ regeneration is mostly to do with uh, making the organ to a right size, right? One of the best examples that we have organ regeneration which we also spoke about Greek mythology is the liver, right? When you cut a liver, the liver grows back to maintain its size, right? So that's an organ specific regeneration. 
structural regeneration is we see lizards growing around us, right? I mean, we have these lizards um, in our houses and all that. And if you cut the limb of a lizard, I, if you actually detach the tail of a lizard, the tail grows back and the limb grows back. This is a structural regeneration. It's, it's making a structure, right? So that the structure is functional. So it's called a structural regeneration. And another most amazing part, what really struck me is this whole body regeneration. There are animals in nature where you take these animals and cut these animals into small pieces and each piece can regenerate back into a complete animal, right? So that makes a wow factor here for me, right? How does these animals do these amazing things? The question remains is why did we lose that capacity, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a break here and then I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so, so, yeah, there's a more questions coming. Yeah, please, uh, please. There's still the technical ones I'm holding back still. I will have to do some juggling here to make sure that we cover everything in, in some uh, sensible manner. Yeah. Um, so this one question is sort of um, a takes off from where you left in response to Harini's question. So evolutionarily, uh, do we know of cases where regenerative ability that is lost has been regained? This is from Ghanendra Singh. Can the thing. So uh, your, the question is, uh, see, you are saying that there are there are independent evolutions of uh, uh, of um, the regenerative capacities, right? Or so if you lost, you, can, do you gain it back. There are there are uh, there are the cephalochordates which are which has this capacity to regenerate. For example, I mean, uh, if you another fantastic model system that really changed the. The, the whole uh, biology field is Drosophila, and they don't have this capacity to regenerate. But as you grow, go, as you move forward in the evolutionary tree, uh, then there are these ethidians, right, which are again um, cephalochordates, if I'm not wrong. So they also have this capacity to regenerate. So there are, so it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether that's an independent evolution of the regenerative capacity are these animals, these ancestrally, these animals have retained this capacity to regenerate and that's how it went forward. So, so I mean, I am not clear about that part of the answer. Yeah. So thus on that point, so do we know of anybody who has tried to place um, uh, different aspects of regeneration on the tree of life and trace its uh, ancestry over time and see where all it emerged and where it got lost and whether it re-emerged later in time? Do so, I mean, any such study? No, 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 people have um, have actually looked at uh, the uh, phylogenetic trees to study how the uh, regeneration has been distributed across the animal kingdom. Uh, for example, the planarians that we look at, I mean, uh, they are grouped under uh, phylum platyhelmin. And there are a lot of animals uh, in that phylum has this massive capacity to regenerate, right? So somewhere with evolution, they were lost and, and they came back again, right? It, it's not they came back, it's just ancestrally they were retained, right? So yes, I mean, people have plotted phylogenetically how the, uh, how the animals have regenerated and, and, uh, and, and it's, it's, not, it's, it's not clear whether there is a pattern associated to it, right? I mean, it's very, it's, it, it, it's in small bursts that you see these animals having this capacity to regenerate, whether they are ancestrally conserved or whether it's an independent evolution, that is highly debatable to me, right? So um, Harini is also following up on this question with uh, when they're losing the power of regeneration, how, how is it they do that? Uh, it's not how and also also it's a question of also why you know we can make that two part question Let's yeah, yeah change that how is mechanistic and why why would they lose it what okay. the so why why will be a very uh, uh, I mean I can only give a very um, philosophical argument to it right so regeneration is an extremely energy demanding process right with the complexity in the evolution of the structures and the organs. Uh, if you have to regenerate at the same capacity at which you are regenerating, uh, say, planaria, uh, the demand on energy levels are extremely high, right? So uh, it's, it's a trade-off uh, that evolution has beautifully played. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a natural selection. I, I call it as a trade-off in terms of uh, energy requirements versus how, what the capacity to regenerate. 
So, uh, so it's better to take and evolve complex structures rather than use that energy to regenerate. So again, it's, a, it's a, again a philosophical argument. Um, I mean, there is no clear cut evidences to show that's what, how it is, right? So that's how I can put it as. So in a nutshell, the take home is the regeneration is an extremely energy demanding process, right? So, uh, so the trade-off when you do regeneration is the energy aspect here. Okay, so that's how I put it across this. Yeah, again, it's a beautiful question and it's highly debatable question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, yeah. I was wondering like uh, these, uh, uh, like these things that you have told and obviously uh, we as uh, scientists have discovered these things and so how, how do, uh, like, how do uh, the uh, scientists who are interested in regeneration studies perform like these experiments and which organism do they consider uh, as, a, as their model system? So, I mean, uh, so that brings back an interesting question, right? Um, Nitesha, I mean, uh, what are the organisms that are well known for regeneration, right? Uh, I'll just show you the next slide. I mean, uh, again, it depends on the kind of question you're asking. I mean, these are the organisms that have been extensively, animals that have been extensively used to study regeneration. So now the question you are asking is, uh, how do we choose a model system to study the regeneration, right? It depends on the kind of question that you are asking in terms of regeneration. For example, if I want to study whole body regeneration or whole animal regeneration, of course, planaria and hydra are the best uh, uh, model systems to look at, right? Uh, so if I want to study regeneration of a specific structure, whether a limb or whether a fin, I will go with salamanders and zebrafish and starfish, right? And if I want to, if I want to study a regeneration at a very tissue specific level, for example, this African spiny mouse, it can shed its whole skin and grow back the skin. So the skin is very loosely attached. You can actually peel off the skin right? And it can grow back the whole skin. So it's very amazing. And it does it in a matter of a month time, right? Mm -hmm. So now, though, though this model system, African spiny mouse has been used to study uh, diabetic related uh, uh, studies, but people have found that this has this amazing capacity to regenerate the skin. And this became a beautiful model to understand how skin regeneration happens. So now, Going back to your question, how do we choose a model system, right? You choose a model system based on the kind of question you ask, right? Mm -hmm. Whole or organism, pick planaria, hydra. I mean, structural regeneration, pick zebrafish, salamanders, starfish. Tissue specific, pick your African spiny mouse if you want to study skin regeneration. So that's how I define it as. So that broadly, that brings this slide. What are the existing models that we have to study regeneration? Uh, these are some of the existing models that we have. So thus, this yeah. um, African spiny mouse thing, is it uh, conceptually different from the molting and so on that snakes do? Uh, no, the molting is actually, uh, it's conceptually, yes, it's different. It's, it's conceptually different because here you are, here you are basically peeling off the whole skin out from the animal and the animal has to rebuild the whole skin back, right? Uh, in uh, in snakes and other species, you are just you are you are you are just peeling off. You are just losing the outer layer of the skin. You are not losing the whole skin. But in an African spiny mouse, you are actually you can actually peel off the whole skin back, and and then it regrows the whole skin. So it's very different from the molting you actually see in uh, snakes. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so so that brings us back to this interesting models and. Uh, and, and one of the models that uh, my lab works as, uh, as Ashwin has rightly introduced is this planaria, which is our hero today. And as I said, I mean, as the introduction goes, this has this capacity to regenerate uh, the whole animal, right? So now, I mean, I'll just tell you, though this animal is considered as a very simple tractable model, but it has its own complexity, which it has to deal with in order to regenerate the tissue, right? So uh, that brings us back to our hero today, which is planarian model. It's called planaria, right? Plane stands for flat. Area stands for the life form. So if you just look at this animal under a microscope, what you see them as a flat worms, 
right? With this cross-eyed, and, and, and they're very cute animals that you actually have to look under a microscope to appreciate the cuteness of these animals, right? So they live in fresh waters. I mean, uh, and they, they don't carry any pathogens or anything. So, and they are very easy to grow. You just have to take a water, put them in the water and they will grow, right? And in many ways, they are Im immortals, right? I mean, uh, they, they, again, I'll, I'll tell you, they, they exist in the, the, the species that we use here is called Shimedia mediterranea. It was found in the Barcelona ponds. And this model was initially took by uh, Professor Emily Salo and later Alejandro picked up and uh, made it as a beautiful model to understand regeneration process, right? And the extensive work has been done both in Europe as well as in North America in order to understand how the regeneration process happens. But in a nutshell, it's extremely easy to grow them, right? So, uh, so that makes them a tractable model. So you can use this model to ask interesting biological questions. So uh, when we say we can regenerate, what does it exactly mean? You can take these animals and you can cut these animals into as much, as many small pieces as you can cut. And this just takes seven days to completely regenerate the whole animal. You can see here, I will just play this video again to you. This is a complete animal. This can grow to the size of one centimeter. So you can take a one centimeter animal and you can cut this animal into small pieces here you can see a head regeneration. In seven days, you can see the eyes forming, right? And by seventh day, it has a functional head, uh, which allows the animal to do what it is doing, right? So uh, this is what I call as a functional regeneration of the whole body when you cut them into a small piece, right? So, so how small is these? Uh, are these uh, animals? Like, uh, this, this, I mean, uh, this grows to a size of one centimeter. This can grow to the to the maximum size of one to two centimeters, right? And um, and then you can chop them off. And in fact, lot of work was done by T. Uh, uh, H. Morgan. Uh, he's well known for his Drosophila genetics, uh, and he's a Nobel laureate. Uh, so uh, he has actually shown by this interesting experiments that. Uh, you can take this animal and cut it into one by 273rd piece. That means a one by 273rd piece of this animal has the capacity to regenerate into a complete animal. Okay. So that makes this animal the most amazing model to look at the capacities to regenerate and ask an extremely interesting questions. And we'll go through some of the interesting questions that we can actually pose and address. Yeah, yeah. Also, also in continuation to like few questions which are already asked in the live chat. So. Mm -hmm. Is, uh, does this regeneration capacity uh, gives uh, planaria some kind of advantage in wild environment? Yes, I mean, uh, so uh, you can imagine of uh, advantages it has, right? I mean, this lives in shallow waters. Mm -hmm. In fact, I mean, where can you find? Is the Let's ask the question where you find them, right? You just walk out of your house. If you have a pond, go to the shallow regions of the pond, take a turn, take a stone from the pond and turn it around, you will actually find the species crawling over the stone. So they re live, live in a really shallow waters. I mean, now you can imagine the advantage they have, right? I mean, if the animal somehow accidentally breaks off, right? They can regenerate back, right? So that's the advantage. I mean, they're also, they're also predated by the, the higher animals, right? Bigger animals, fishes and all that. So when they are, when they were cut or when they were a piece is eaten off, the other piece can regenerate back. Okay. So that's the advantage these animals get living in shallow waters where they are prone to the preys, right? So that's the advantage these animals have. Uh, so uh, so that that brings us back to uh, the whole idea of regeneration, right? So so as I said, so thus. Yeah, I, I think I will take one of the more technical questions that yeah, please uh, came go. earlier. So yeah. when we showed uh, the planarian regeneration, we started off with a certain cell and then we had the head and different types of cells, um, of different types of tissues forming and that, that's the differentiation process. So here uh, we had one question from uh, Sonali. She's asking is this process of differentiation and if we have to reverse the differenti differentiation process, would it be equal to the differentiation? Uh, so, I mean, so uh, the differentiation is uh, 
so the so, okay so the question is uh, how does this animals regenerate right i mean that's the question basically uh, so, there, there is a process called different de differentiation where uh, you have a terminally differentiated cell the terminally differentiated cell is pushed back into a stem cell when i say stem cell stem cell is a cell that has a capacity to regenerate uh, that has a capacity to differentiate into any cell type right so now you have a terminally differentiated cell say you have a skin cell right and the skin cell can be pushed back into a stem cell and this stem cell can regenerate back or can differentiate back into any cell type so that is called de differentiation right so here this animals don't do de differentiation this animals have stem cells we'll come to that which are which have the capacity to differentiate into any cell type okay so that's the difference so the so sonali is bringing out an interesting concept here one concept is de differentiation where you take a cell like a skin cell and push it back into a stem cell and allow the stem cells to differentiate back right that's de differentiation so the other aspect is you have a stem cell already inside you and that can differentiate into multiple cell types so that's 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 a differentiation right but these animals don't do de differentiation so that yeah. we uh, okay so this uh, relates to uh, morgan's statement about 1 into 73 parts so do we know if there is a minimum size for regeneration this is sort of asked by ganendra singh and sharbari also asks is the size of the animal related to its ability to uh, uh, so uh, i mean uh, see, uh, there, there are studies i mean if you if you if you cut the animal into a extremely small piece uh, that animal might not regenerate completely back i mean there was this i mean basically you need to have uh something like uh say, you need to have those stem cells within that tissue in order for the tissue to regenerate back so if you have those stem cells in a tissue you can cut the tissue to as small as possible but as long as you have those stem cells residing in the tissue that tissue has the capacity to regenerate back right that's how i define it as yeah and then so here is something to do with um, the you you mentioned that you one might lose uh, the ability to regenerate because it's an it's a costly uh, process so vitore so hi vitore so vitore asks um, so where is the planaria taking the energy to regenerate from some fat reservoirs or is it digesting it is food from the uh, environment and continuing the the evolutionary argument for uh, uh, regeneration harini had also asked so uh, can these animals that regenerate can they survive without the power of uh, uh, regeneration again if yes or if no how uh, so, so we have to you, can, I, can, I, can you can you repeat the harini's question so can animals survive without the power of regeneration and if yes how if no how so i mean for okay so uh, let me but that's that again this is a beautiful question from harini i will answer harini's question and by go back to vitori's question so uh, the the point is if there is a damage to the tissue if the tissue are a are a animal fails to regenerate in what happens right the animal will subsequently die right or in other cases it need not have to always regenerate as long as it has enough structures to survive what it can potentially do is it can close the wound and survive right so uh, so that can also potentially allow the animal to survive it need not survive, not make the all the structures back but suppose if the structure that is essential for the feeding process is missing and it is not regenerating that so basically the animal is failing to uh, feed right as a result the animal will shrink and subsequently it might die right so that's how i define it as so the what is regeneration doing is it, regeneration is making the lost organs which helps the animals to grow back right which helps animals to be be active and functional in the environment right 
if they don't have that capacity to regenerate yes subsequently they might actually die because they lack the organs that allow them to survive so that's how i'll put it as going back to vitter's question which is a very interesting question uh where does this get the energy so it 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 when when you when there's an injury the cells that are near the vicinity of the injury actually undergoes apoptosis right so uh, so and that actually gives the raw materials back to the animal in order to regenerate back so when i take a 3 cm animal or a 1 cm animal and cut it into 1 mm it doesn't mean that when i say regeneration uh, making the whole animal it doesn't mean that it it is um, it is regenerating to a capacity of 1 cm a 1 mm animal regenerates back to get all its organs in place but the size will be 1 mm to grow back to 1 cm it has to constantly feed and then grow back to 1 cm so when i say regeneration it's it's regeneration means making of lost tissues it's not growing to the same size to grow to the same size it needs to actively feed to to make the lost tissue it uses the cells that are at the vicinity of the injury in order to get the raw materials for it to regenerate so that's how i define it as right so this is interesting thus the idea that you need the apoptosis of uh, surrounding cells would probably also set uh, a minimum requirement of how many cells you need to have in a tissue it's not just the stem cell then so you probably also need a certain environment for that uh, absolutely absolutely you're right is is that characterized uh it's it's been it's be, it has been worked out in uh, different model systems right um uh, so it's not uh, i mean so in fact i mean when i said you need uh, apoptosis apoptosis also signals uh, the stem cells to actually proliferate and come to the vicinity of the of the injury and 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 differentiate and make the tissue there right and so people have worked out pathways that actually kick start and initiate if those pathways are missing uh you don't see the regeneration happening right so the question that you are trying to ask me is is there a minimal requirement of a tissue i mean uh, i have to say i am sorry about this so what i have to say is i don't know the exact answer uh, in terms of uh, what will be the minimal tissue has that been worked out i'm not sure about it yeah yeah so uh, so that brings back uh, to our uh, our hero again which is planaria here so the planaria exists in two different strains right one is sexual strain other is an asexual strain so that when i say sexual strain it has a reproductive organs uh, which which helps them uh, to to uh, sexually reproduce right when i say asexual strain they don't have the reproductive organs so since they don't have the reproductive organs they regenerate by just breaking down into two pieces so basically what happens in nature is this animal stretch breaks down into two pieces and grows back into a complete animal what you see on my right side is the tissue organization in this animals like us they have this intestinal branch like us uh, they have this primitive excretory system called protonephridia they have a very well organized nervous system and they have reproductive organs i mean in sexual animals they do have reproductive organs and these are hermaphrodites they have both testes they have as well as ovaries right so when i say these animals are regenerating just imagine that wherever you cut these animals can make all these organs right uh so let's 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 dive so and now uh, though the asexual animals don't have reproductive organs but they still regenerate the intestines they still regenerate the excretory system they still regenerate the nervous system so i'll just show you a very interesting video uh this was the work that actually came from um, uh professor alejandro sanchez lab uh you can actually see this video here uh this is 
a asexual animal actually undergoing uh, uh, fission, they just break into two pieces and regenerate back, right? So, uh, and this happens in the nature. And what triggers it is it's not very clearly understood, right? You can see, I mean, look at this, this video actually gives me the goosebumps. So you can see these animals there, and then you see this animal stretching, right? And it suddenly snaps off, right? I can, you can see a small tail there, here, and then you see the other animal here. This small tail grows back into a complete animal. And this animal here makes the tail back. And most of the time, the break happens only in the tail region, not in the head region, right? So, I mean, people are trying to understand, researchers across the world are trying to understand what triggers this process of fission, right? And what triggers when the fission has to happen, right? Uh, is there any size constraints in terms of triggering when the fission process happens? So these are some of the outstanding questions that are being addressed in the across the world among different researchers, right? So, so does, uh, does uh, this kind of like asexual reproduction uh, happens at a particular life, uh, life stage of planaria like asexual? No. Okay, so when I say asexuals are literally immortals, right? Mm -hmm. They don't die. And there's nothing like a life stage. They are there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I'm trying to put forward is we actually don't know what drives this process of fission. What, what is it? What is a ticking point where they decide, okay, then they have to undergo fission. So a lot of work is being done in that area. And still that area is an open area to ask such interesting questions. What triggers it? And, and we don't have answers for many of those questions, right? So, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're, as I said, they're all immortals, basically. Asexuals are immortals, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're just big bacteria, thus. Yeah, big bacteria. <laughs> they have many cells. That's, that's <laughs> uh, yeah, there, 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 there's, a, there's just an accumulation of bacterial cells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but with a mitochondria in them. Huh? <laughs> yeah, which, well, they are so, which means they are bacteria anyway. Yeah, they have. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's, let's uh, I mean, I, what I will do is. Uh, thus, we have a question here, though. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, this is from Ganesh. So he's asking, will the regenerative planaria be able to reproduce? Regenerative planaria will be able to reproduce? Yes, the answer is yes. I mean, uh, the asexuals regenerate extensively. In fact, um, I mean, uh, they, they regenerate. They don't undergo this fission, right? They don't, they don't snap off like this. Uh, but when you cut them, they regenerate back. So when they regenerate back, they're also making their uh, germline tissue, which is, uh, which is reproductive tissues, in order for that to undergo sexual reproduction. So they lay eggs, the eggs hatch, the babies come out, right? And the babies grow, right? And they also have the capacity to regenerate, right? You take these animals and you keep cutting them as much as you want. Every time you cut, they regenerate and they regenerate back into the same size, um, if you feed them enough, and then they also make all the organs, they undergo sexual reproduction, everything. But these animals, what you see on my screen, which are asexual animals, don't actually undergo sexual reproduction. That's why they're called as asexuals. Okay, yeah. So let's quickly look into this fascinating tissue organization, right? These guys have eyes, as described by Darwin, where uh, they have this, uh, they have, they call this as an optic curve, or optic cup, which reflects the light. And what you see here in green is this beautiful photoreceptor neurons, right? They take the message that is collected, which is a light here, and they convey it back to the brain, right? And, and this is the, I mean, this is the most simplistic definition what Darwin gave. Uh, for the function of an eye where you actually take the light and you project it back onto the brain in order to understand where the animal is located, right? So, uh, so, and then what you see to the right is a beautiful organization of a brain. What you see on the top here, we call it as anterior in biology, right? The top is the bilobed brain here, right? And our brain is also bilobed. 
And then it has this ventral nerve cord that runs across the body here. And what you see, these little dots here, you see, they are the commissural neurons that connect to every part of the organ. Now look at the complexity of regeneration. This is where you will start appreciating the, 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 the nature's beauty of regeneration, right? Now I take this animal and I can cut this animal into small pieces. This animal can make the brain back. This animal may, can make the eye back, right? And does what it has to do. So now the question comes is, how does they do, right? And not only this, they also, this, this animal is nothing but a bag of muscles. We have our muscles, right? And when muscles do this structural role for us, similarly, these animals are completely weaved around this bag of muscles, right? What you see here is a smooth muscle that weaved around the bag. And this muscle gives the structural identity to the animal, right? And very interestingly, I mean, we'll, we'll come across if we have time, this muscle also gives the positional cue, right? For example, uh, I said that if I cut the head of a planaria, something has to tell planaria that it has to make the head back. That information, interestingly, comes from the muscle organization in the planarians that make this model system and beautiful model system to understand the functions of the muscle in terms of the regenerative capacity, right? So, uh, and there are different kinds of muscles. There are longitudinal muscles, there are circular muscles. You can see, I mean, I don't have to explain, this is so self-explanatory that you have the, the long ones that run down are longitudinal, the ones that run curve are the circular muscles, right? And this is another fascinating, like the way we have intestines, these animals also have intestines like us, right? I mean, not exactly like us, but they have a beautifully organized intestine. So they belong to this order for, called tricladida. That means they have three branched intestine. You have one long tube here running from the anterior to the posterior. And there is something called pharynx here. At the pharynx, pharynx is a tube that actually feeds on the food. And at the pharynx, they break into two tubes again and run down. So there are three branched intestines, one here, two and three branched intestines. So why I'm showing you all this is that so you appreciate as much as we say these are simplistic models to understand regeneration, but the complexity of tissue is amazing. And these animals know how to make this tissue when they lost it. And frankly, we don't have the capacity to regenerate the whole organs in our body, right? So the question is, what did we lose? And they gained, they have that, what we lost, right, to regenerate. So, uh, and I, I and explained this to you, right? I mean, it can regenerate the whole head in a matter of seven days, right? When Now you can appreciate when I say head regeneration, it is making the brain, it is making the eye back, right? And making it functional, that's the best part. There is another fascinating part of uh, Planaria, which was uh, written in one of these beautiful reviews from Phil Newmark and Alejandro. You can take the Planaria. I said Planaria can grow to one centimeter size. You can take the Planaria, you can starve the Planaria enormously and bring it to the size of say one to two millimeter. So you're basically reducing the size by thousand fold. And now you take that small Planaria and feed it back. It can grow back to the normal size the plasticity it expresses in terms of shrinking and growing back is enormous, right? And so now it has the brain, it has the intestine, it has neurons, it has muscle. So when it grows from three, one centimeter back to two millimeter, it has to reduce the size of the organs accordingly, right? And when it grows back to one centimeter, it has to really regrow the organs back to that size. Man, this is like amazing, right? So this brings to an interesting point. So Every, thus, yeah. does it actually retain functionality of all organs or does it just sacrifice some organs while it grows small and oh, then rebuilds it? One, one organ, it actually sacrifices this reproductive tissue because it's completely dispensable for the animal. But it actually holds on to the functions of the other organs, right? Without compromising the function of that. So it should not compromise the function, right? But it has to reduce the size. That's a challenge for the animal and it reduces size by thousand fold. 
and when it grows back it has to grow back grow back the size so the, the lot of discussion happen whether it's compromising the cell volume you can reduce the size by reducing the volume of a cell right or you can do it by oh i am muted no 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 it's fine oh, no okay fine okay. so that there i think maybe the last sentence or two uh, yeah. was not clear i think so what i'm saying is uh, there are two things here which is interesting is how can you bring down the size right if you are not audible let me know nitish how do you bring down the size you can bring down the size by reducing the volume of the cell right or you can reduce the number it has been shown that these guys can actually bring down their size by reducing the number so basically they bring down the number of cells that they have in order to reduce the size of the animal so when they grow back they need to bring up the number of cells in order to reach that growth right so they actually play with the cell numbers in order to change their size right so that makes them fascinating and they are all it's all happening without compromising the organization of the tissue so that's the best part so which means there is a, sort of a proportional reduction in different yes uh, <laughs> so that ashwin that brings us to a very interesting point of maintenance of proportionality right yeah so i will i will touch it briefly when we come back to the end part of our conversation so uh, should i move or should i take any more questions i think at this point i'll ask one question here Uh, so which is sort of very closely related to everything that we've talked about so this again from sonali she's asking if uh, regeneration is uh, inversely related to complexity of uh, species uh i don't know i mean uh, yes and no yes because we know as the complexity of the tissue has grown uh, the capacity to regenerate has gone down so in a way the answer is yes but there are there are i mean see uh, i mean when you say structural complexity the the organ is doing what it has to do in the environment it is right uh, for that environment the animal living in that niche uh, for that animal it's a complex environment right uh, but 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 yeah i mean again it's extremely debatable i mean in a ways uh, my personal opinion i agree with her as the complexity of the tissue has grown uh there is a compromise in the capacity to regenerate again i think the trade off here is the energy to me yeah. so again on that uh, sharvari is asking a question building on that so she is asking what is the largest known animal that can, uh, well largest animal that is known to undergo systemic regeneration now uh, what do you uh, what is meant by systemic regeneration i think it's not just probably not like well we just regenerate liver right uh, or, yeah. so it's yeah. like like a planarian like a planarian uh, the largest animal that can do a planarian <laughs> <laughs> uh, i mean uh, uh, yeah as i said there are cdns that can uh, regenerate which are uh, you know cephalochorid i think they can regenerate uh, i don't know any other uh, vertebrates or uh, or uh, ordates that has the same capacity to regenerate uh i i i don't think so i i don't know that yeah. so uh, and you also mentioned that en- energy would be a reason why certain animals lost um uh, regeneration so on that uh, harini has a question so do these animals which have lost regeneration do they gain some other advantages yeah complexity is complexity an advantage uh complexity it's philosophical for example it's very philosophical argument i mean it can be it can be highly debated i mean again i mean i i think i think uh, harini is asking the most pertinent questions i have to tell you uh so yes it's a it's a philosophical argument to me why philosophical argument when you say this is structural complexity right or not not structural even functional complexity for example if you take our brain uh so the reason why human can adapt to multiple environments is because of their capacity to imagine think and execute right so that is something that we gain because of the functional complexity that we acquired that's our brain basically right and the compromise here to my understanding is the capacity to regenerate because if our energy is been driven in term just to regenerate this kind of 
complex functional evolution of organs would have not happened, which allows us to adapt to the environment better. That's how I'll put it as, right? So, I mean, this is my personal opinion. Let me tell you that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Das, so maybe uh, can we give a, a brief basic overview of how the uh, regeneration itself uh, happens, what it um, involves, because there are quite a few mechanistic questions. Yeah. I don't think we will be able to go through this. Yeah. And uh, uh, a child like Harini is wondering if it is... Um, particles which combine to uh, to regenerate and we have questions about regulatory networks involved in regeneration so can we find some compromise yes and, uh, I, mean, I, what, you know? I mean i have to tell you i mean um, i mean man i mean i think i can see what her knee will become when she grows uh, so yes i mean uh, uh, yeah let, let me quickly tell you i mean so in a very again what her knee is bringing as a child uh, is this uh, this whole idea of uh, uh, self-organization of tissues, right? And it has been beautifully put across uh, by studies uh, from, uh, I mean, Peter Regan's lab in MIT and other places, right? Um, so yeah, that's true. In, in a way, things come together, they self-organize. So let's, let's go back to bigger details here. How does this animal do? That's the question that's coming down to, right? I mean, where does this animal get this capacity to regenerate? The answer lies in the stem cells. They have stem cells distributed across the animal. So let me explain what stem cell is. Stem cell is, as the, the word stems brings the fact that it's an important cell, right? And this cell has the capacity to regenerate or differentiate into any tissue type, right? And what you see the red dots here and in a in a in Harini's language, the particles, right? But they are cells. Uh, has this red dot that you see here in the slide are the stem cells which has the capacity to regenerate. And there is this word that biologists use is called pluripotency. That means this stem cell has the capacity to differentiate or to make any other cell type, right? So that those kind of a cells that has the capacity to make any other cell type are called as pluripotent stem cells, right? So let's not go into jargons. Pluripotency is the capacity to make any cell type. And this 30% of these animals have this specified cell types. And these are called as neoblast in planaria. So in a way, neoblast are the stem cells that has the capacity to regenerate or allow the animal to regenerate and make the organs what were lost because of accidents or amputations, right? So that brings us to this uh, mechanistic view of how stem cells regenerate, right? So uh, this is what I tried to explain now. You have one thing called pluripotent, where a cell has the capacity to regenerate and make all the cell types. And there is another definition in uh, the uh, in in the in the stem cell field. It's called multipotent. That means a cell has a limited capacity to make cell types. For example, a blood a stem cell originated from a blood can only make a blood cell, right? Uh, there is something called dedifferentiation or reprogramming. People do that, but let's not get into that. A, the, the, the hematopoiesis is a, is a process of making blood cells, right? And they are called as hematopoietic stem cells because those stem cells make blood cells. So those stem cells can only make blood cells. They can't make anything else. Such cells are called as multipotent cells. They have a limited capacity. So one of the key questions that were asked in planaria field is, do they have pluripotent stem cells, All right? So now let's, let's also put the question, I mean, how do we prove whether a cell is multipotent or pluripotent, right? So let, let's do a small, simple experiment that has been actually done in the field, right? Uh, to understand whether the cell has the capacity to make any cell type or whether the cell can only make a specific cell type, right? Or in other words, the question will be, do planarians have pluripotent stem cells? That's the question, right? So 
and they have done a very simplistic experiments, right? Uh, we can do cell transplantation experiments. That means you can take stem cells from one planaria and you can inject it into another planaria. So we all heard about radiations, right? If you guys have watched this move, uh, series on uh, Hotstar called Chernobyl, when the radioactive radiations hit you, it actually kills the cells inside you, right? And the cells that actually die very quickly when the radiations hit are your stem cells. So what we can do is we can take planaria, hit with radiation and kill all the stem cells, right? And ask what happens to planaria. Of course, the planaria will die because they don't have stem cells, right? The question we are asking is whether the stem cells are pluripotent or whether the stem cells can make any other cell type or not. So now what they did is they took planaria, they hit with radiation, they killed all the cells. They took stem cells from another planaria and injected back that into this animal, right? And the animal survived, right? So one interesting concept which we also do as humans is tissue turnover. For example, our skin, is constantly shed and we make new skin. Our blood cells undergo constant turnover. That means we lose blood cells from our body and we make blood cells. Similarly, there is something called tissue turnover in planarians also. The tissues die and you need to make a new tissue. If you kill all the stem cells, right? And if they cannot make the tissue, the animal will die. That's the reason why animal dies, right? But now, if the stem cells are pluripotent in nature, right? And if you take these stem cells, inject them back, if the animal survives, it tells you that these cells can make many tissue types, right? So that's what they did. But what they did in this experiment is they took a lot of cells and injected. If you inject a lot of cells, I can always argue that they are multipotent right? Because I'm injecting multiple cells here. So in order to counter that narrative, right? Saying that whether the cells are multipotent or pluripotent, they have done a fabulous experiment, right? What they have done is, this again came from Peter Reading's lab in MIT. Instead of injecting many cells, they took one stem cell from planaria and injected into the planaria and they have shown that they can rescue the planaria, right? Now you can't counter argue. Now you have injected one cell, right? And that one cell is sufficient enough to rescue the whole animal. Suggesting that these animals indeed have the pluripotent stem cells. And that's how they proved. And, and these experiments are beautiful, right? I mean, the way they so did thus, it. So just to uh, clarify, it's just one random neoblast, not selected in particular ways. No, no, one random neoblast, but they injected the stem cell. One random stem cell was taken and injected, right? It's a very hard hitting experiment, uh, uh, Ashwin. I mean, uh, it's tremendously it's a painstaking experiment which they have done and I mean, it's a hard stuff to them. So, but... But it's not uh, finished here, uh, Ashwin. What they have done is this interesting, right? I said planarians exist in two strains, one sexual strain, one asexual strain, right? So what they have done is they irradiated sexual animal. That means they killed all the stem cells from sexual animal. They took a stem cell from an asexual animal and injected into a sexual animal. And they could actually convert a sexual animal into an asexual animal, right? So what now this animal does is asexuals don't undergo fission. That means they don't snap off. By injecting one stem cell from an asexual animal into a sexual animal, they actually have shown that this actual sexual animals becomes asexual. They can undergo, they can snap off and regenerate back again. So I mean, thus are these genetically distinct? The two strains? Uh, no, no, the, those strains are not uh, genetically distinct. Yes, and yes, answer is it's genetically. Let me put this way: uh, they belong to this. They belong to this uh, species, Chimedia mediterranea. What happened is in asexual animals, 
a piece of a chromosome underwent translocation. As a result, they lost germline tissue, but they, they got the capacity to undergo fission. That's very interesting, right? A small piece from a chromosome was snapped off and went to a different chromosome. That's a translocation event, right? That translocation event gave them the capacity to undergo fission, but they lost sexual reproduction. So now you take a stem cell from that animal, asexual animal, and put it into a sexual animal. And now sexual animal becomes an asexual, right? So that experiment beyond doubt proved that these planarians have stem cells that can make any other cell type, which we call it as pluripotent stem cells, right? So that's, that's I think, that's the most mind-blowing experiment that they have done. But thus, if so this does. experiment would have uh, done in a reverse manner, like the uh, like the the new feature which has been acquired after translocation. So uh, just take it other way around. Um, you incorporate uh, like the stem cells from sexual to asexual organism. So does that uh, make the asexual organism reproduce sexually? Ah, uh, they haven't done. Right, and uh, I have to tell you, I don't have a clear answer for that. Yeah, okay. I don't have a clear answer for that. Yeah, yeah. But so, yeah. Uh, we have more questions, very, very interesting questions. And okay. uh, though we are over uh, time, if you are okay, should we go on? I am and happy to talk. Perfect. As as people are happy to listen. Perfect. So here there is. Um, uh, this it, it actually leads together to this amazing question that Vittore has asked. I've been holding on for a, an opportune moment. So here, I'll, I'll just read it verbatim. <clears throat> Can planaria be a good model for epigenetic memory? How are individuals different from each other? Are there characteristic differences in terms of proportion, color? Does regeneration retain individuality if there is an uh, individuality? Here and all of these. Uh, lead oh my God, I mean that's uh, a that's a that's a very philosophical question. So let's go now. One question which is not philosophical is epigenetic memory, right? Um, so very interestingly, um, uh, Dr. Aziz of Baker's lab have shown that uh, uh, there is no methylation events on this uh, in, in, on on the, on the genome of planaria, but the 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 histone modifications could still uh, hold true here. And, uh, and, and that's some area that has not been really worked out well, right? And that's that area is still open uh, uh, for research and, and, and work is happening, I know that. So I cannot comment on that, but that's a, that's a very interesting question. And that's a very interesting uh, research question to look into is an epigenetic memory, right? So uh, going back to uh, this, this brings up a very interesting, uh, uh, there was a beautiful article from uh, uh, Alejandro and Yamanaka about, uh, uh, about planaria regeneration, regeneration in general. Uh, we all heard about this concept called ship of the thesis, right? Where uh, if you take a ship and keep changing plank by plank, right? Whether it's the same ship or a different ship, right? So the same question comes to planaria. If you cut this animal into a small piece, right? Whether it's the same planaria when it regenerates or a different planaria. So, uh, so it's, it's a little paradox, right? In, in, in animals like planaria in invertebrates, what does an animal do is maintains its shape and size, especially the shape. So if what regeneration in a vase or a tissue turnover in a vase doing is to maintain the shape of the animal, right? So most of the time, when you say something is regenerating, you are actually trying to maintain its shape, right? And in order to maintain its shape, you need to have a tissue turnover. For a tissue turnover to happen, you need to have regeneration. So that is how I put that argument across. So now if you go back and ask the question, whether uh, a animal that regenerates the brain, is it the same animal or a diff different animal? I mean, my simplistic answer to that is they're all clonal selections, 
That, that means they all came from one animal and they were cut and they were regenerated back. So uh, that's how I will answer that and I leave it there because now if you ask whether uh, they retain memory, I, I mean, I don't have much understanding about this memory aspect for the planarians. There were some interesting studies that were done uh, by different labs across in terms of memory. Uh, I will not go into that area for now. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, um, okay, so this is something that uh, we, I think we were chatting about a few years ago. Yeah. Lucy Judge, she asks, neoplasts remind me of cancer. Is there a relation? Uh, no, I mean, uh, oh, yeah, I mean, see, uh, neoblast is a stem cell, right? Now the question comes is, so one of the key questions here, uh, what is the interesting question is that, right? We call something as homeostasis, right? You need to maintain a balance. So if I lose 100 cells, I need to make 100 cells. If I make 100,000 cells, in a very loose terms, you call it as a cancer, right? So neoblast is not a cancer, it's a stem cell which gets enough cues from the environment to make a tissue, to make the tissue functional. That means it needs to make enough cells in order for the tissue to be a functional tissue, right? So in other ways, neoblast is not a cancer. But the question is, for an animal that rapidly regenerates, does it have cancer, right? That means, can neoblast, instead of making 100 cells, will it make 100,000 cells? In a natural system, that doesn't happen, but there were some interesting experiments that were done where a knockdown of specific genes uh, led to the loss of this balance. As a result, the stem cells started making excess of cells. As a result, you see these outgrowths coming on the planaria. Right, So that also brings back, there's an interesting balance that is set in the stem cells to tell the stem cells how many cells they have to make. right? And that comes from the environment and also within. Environment, when I say the micro environment in which the stem cells are residing, that's what I meant by it. Yeah. And, and with so, this how question, uh, I, I would like to ask like, how do these cells know when and where to make? Yeah, so that is, uh, that's another uh, mind-blowing question. So uh, that's what brings me to the next slide, uh, regeneration in planaria. So I said there are so pluripotents. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this, so the, well, this is probably linked to a question that Harini had just put in. Are there different types of, well, she calls it neoplasts, neoplasts. And uh, can you name some? I guess this is, this is probably... Yeah, yeah. The answer, no. That does the answer. Man, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the kind of questions Harini is asking. Yes, answer is yes to her. So that's what this slide says. So you have the pluripotent neoblast, which has a capacity to make any cell type, and then you have something called committed neoblast. That means uh, I call the committed neoblast as multipotent, right? They were committed to make a specific cell type, and then. The committed neoblast makes progenitors, and progenitors means they are the precursors of uh, terminally differentiated cells, and then they make a terminally differentiated cells. So are there many neoblasts? Yes, along with the pluripotent neoblast, there are also many other neoblasts which are committed to make a specific cell type. So that's the answer to that. So that brings to the question that was raised by Nitish, how does a stem cell know what it has to make, right? So the question is, where are the positional cues coming from? So uh, I don't know whether I have the slide here, uh, but just take my word for it. The planaria has muscles distributed all across the animal. For example, if you cut the planaria here, what I have shown, the, the 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 side which makes the head is called anterior and the side that makes the tail is called posterior okay so just keep that term in all this in mind so the muscles that are near the anterior side gives the cues or gives the information to the stem cells to make the head and the muscles which are on the posterior side gives the information to make the tail right the information to regenerate the tissue is actually coming from the muscle that is residing near the injury. So now what tells the muscle to make that? 
is not still clear in the feet. This is interesting, uh, Ashwin. I mean, this is again, is an interesting debatable question here. If you go back to the tail, you cut at the tail. Let, let's, let's talk in a very layman terms. There is a memory in the muscle near the tail to make the tail, right? That's how the tail is there. Mm. But now I cut the tail. The tail can make the head. That means the muscle has to rewire itself to tell the tail it has to make the head. So that is still not clearly understood. How that is happening is not clearly understood in the feet. So, so that is means... It, this is it already there, Das? Do they but, already, is it, does the, 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 the local signaling that yeah. is already there in the intact animal already pre there. It's set there. it in a certain direction? It's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, already there in the animal, right? So, so it should come down to the gradients. The, the ah, it the, comes down to the gradient. That's where I'm coming down. So this is a famous uh, painting from Leonardo da Vinci, right? I mean, that guy is a genius. What he, what he represents here is a human form. Uh, with all the proportions exactly intact. For example, if you go back and look at uh, uh, from the hairline here till the chin is one by tenth, right, uh, of the uh, size of the uh, height of the body. This is not his painting. This is a reality. This is not his painting. That's a reality. If you measure the distance from uh, the tip of this finger till the tip of the other finger, when you stretch the hand, the length of that is the height of your body. That means when a, when a, when a, when, when, when a system is developing, when an when a animal is developing, the size and shape are beautifully ingrained during the development, right? So, but development is a highly programmed process, right? It is so highly programmed, so you actually know when you need to actually make this kind of instructive cues. But now imagine this in the context of regeneration, man. You take an animal and you can cut this animal anywhere. It still has to maintain the proportionality, right? And it has to maintain the organs by maintaining the proportionality. So the biggest question that this model system is trying to give us back or we are trying to understand this model system from this model system is how proportions are maintained, right? In a animal system, right? So that's what brings us to the interesting question that Ashwin has brought, uh, which was experiments that were done by Thomas Morgan. Thomas Morgan has published this enormous so, papers in my standards. I yeah. I will just interrupt. At this point, I think we should uh, uh, advertise Sean Carroll's famous book, right? 15-year-old, Endless Forms, Most Beautiful. Yeah. Which yeah, basically, yeah. that's what, uh, this is what it uh, talks about. And it's just so beautifully Sorry. written. It almost reads like, um, you know, yeah. a Lee Child novel or something. It just, Absolutely. I think that's probably the best uh, reference yeah, I mean, for anybody. It's scientifically I, I, rigorous. And it's popular as well. I mean, I suggest everybody should read that book. Everybody should read that book. I completely agree with Ashwin on that. So, I mean, uh, quickly, if you look at this slide, I mean, this, this, this chap has published enormous papers in 1900, right, before he moved into studying Drosophila. He basically took animals and he cut the animals in every possible directions and, uh, and, and proportions. And he interestingly noted that Wherever you cut the animal, the anterior is always an anterior and posterior is always a posterior. So uh, he, he very loosely proposed uh, the idea that there could be some kind of a gradients that could exist in the animal that tells you what is anterior and what is posterior. And uh, we know famous Turing experiments and all that, right? I mean, French flag models and all that. So where we know now that there are gradients that are set but these gradients we know is developmentally that they are set that allows the growing embryo to tell what is anterior, what is posterior, right? But in these animals, the gradients are there, right? To tell the animal what is anterior and what is posterior. So in a way, we lost the gradients, but these guys have retained those gradients, right? The fact is how did they retain those gradients? 
So that brings us the interesting uh, point in biology, which is the axis, right? I mean, uh, if you go back and look at, uh, just quickly look at Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, I mean, one half of the body, when you say, when you cut the body longitudinally, right? Uh, this is in biology called bilateral symmetry. That means one side is a mirror image of the other side, right? So that's his bilateral symmetry. And then in addition to that, that's the midline. That is midline, right? And what you see is the lateral axis here. So it's called medial lateral axis. So that's called medial, midline, and lateral axis. That defines bilateral symmetry. And the other axis that you have is an anterior and posterior. We decided, we described about it, right? Anterior makes the head, posterior makes the tail. The other axis, we call it as an AP axis. The other axis is dorsoventral axis. The eyes of the animal are on the dorsal side, like on this side, right? And then they have the uh, ventral nerve cord on the ventral side. So in a very layman terms, our body has an X, Y, and a Z axis. The crosstalk of X, Y, and Z axis tells the animal where the stem cell has to make the organ. So in a way, it's like a mathematics ingrained inside the body, right? So for instance, your y-axis, your ap-axis, your x-axis is your medial lateral axis, and your z-axis is your dorsoventral axis. So the three axes, in a way, cross talk with each other to tell the stem cell where it has to make the organ. For instance, if you disrupt any of these axes, you lose that positional information and you will not make where you need to make the organs, right? So I will just tell you this interesting experiment uh, that was published by, by a couple of labs um, uh, from Alejandro's lab and also from Peter Reading's lab uh, done by my collaborator, Jochen Rink uh, also. Uh, so, uh, so now Ashwin brought this interesting concept of a gradient, right? So there is a gradient. When we say gradient, what is gradient meant by? Something is high on one side and something is low on the other side. So the high and the low is actually being measured by the body to tell what is head and what is tail. So what they have found is there is this interesting protein called beta-catenin. Let's not get into the details of that. There's this interesting protein called beta-catenin. So the beta-catenin is more on the tail side and less on the head side, right? And this gradient tells what is head and what is tail. So very simple experiment they have done is, now if you remove this molecule, or if you disrupt the gradient, what happens? And what they interestingly found is, if you disrupt this gradient, the animal, instead of regenerating eye and a tail, or a head and a tail, it lands up regenerating head on both sides, right? So this tells you that, I mean, is this new to the developmental biologist? Answer is it's not new to the developmental biologist. What is interesting is an animal that is actually regenerating holds that capacity, right? To distribute the gradient, to get the information, to tell the animal how it has to regenerate. That makes this regenerating models an extremely interesting models to look at. Right? So that is what you see here on the slide. So here, if you disrupt that gradient, you land up getting a two-headed planaria, which will which is moving around in the in, in, in the in, in the water, right? I mean they're not dying actually. If you take, in fact, it's not two-headed, you actually it's a planaria with multiple heads. And this multiple headed planaria is happily swimming around in the water, right? But what they lost is the posterior part, right? So this animals in a way don't have the capacity to eat, right? So this is one beautiful example of how an animal knows what it has to regenerate. And this is one beautiful example how an animal can regenerate what it has to regenerate at a right place, right? So this is the importance of gradients, axes, 
your XYZ axis and how the crosstalk of these three axis helps the animals to make where the organs are being made. So uh, that brings us back to this slide again, right? We spoke about one little animal here, which is called planaria. So thus, we have this amazing capacity to regenerate. Yes, Ashwin. So before we get back to the diversity, so we have this uh, interesting question. So, so is, I think you also mentioned the axis and so on. So is development a mathematical idea? So it's a question from Sonali. Everything uh, is, I mean, yeah, mathematics, we, mathematics is a nature, right? What we are talking here is about proportions, right? We are talking about how proportions are managed, right? I mean, you can build beautiful mathematical models in order to understand how these proportions are being made, managed, how these gradients are distributed. In fact, Alan Turing is a mathematician who came with these interesting gradient models, right, to explain how the patterns happen in the biological systems, right? So, I mean, in, in a ways, I mean, mathematics is nature, right? Yeah. So, thus, in continuation of your like, previous slide, uh, I have this question, like, do these, like, do we know whether, what are the positional cues that these cells have? So, like, if you cut the or, or, organism at the, like, the tail side, so that means those cells near the tail side knows that they are at some, like maybe if you talk in terms of axis, they're at zero, zero point, and then they have to reach towards the 10th point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, so, I mean, uh, one interesting question is, see, I mean, this is what I also tried to bring with the muscle here, right? Mm -hmm. So, this is a gradient. That means there's something, sorry, there's something very high on the tail side. Mm -hmm. But now if I, high means it has to make a tail. Right. So now I cut the tail. There is something already high there. How does so? It's 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 actually measuring there, right? It's very high. High means tail, but now suddenly tail has the capacity to make the head. That means something what is high has to be brought down. So this is what we call it as rescaling of the gradient. Mm -hmm. You need to rescale the gradient in order to make the head. If you don't do that, you will not make it, right? In fact, you can generate animals with two tails on either side, not two heads, right? Because there's something, there's some active process that is coming from the anterior side. In fact, it has also been beautifully shown in Hydra. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the whole concept of uh, uh, head organizer actually came from studies in Hydra, right? There is something, I mean, I'll come back to that model system. I might not have so much time to dwell into it. A lot of beautiful experiments were done in Hydra in terms of uh, grafting. The whole the concept that there's a head organizer, which actually distributes this gradient, which helps the Hydra to grow back to what it is, right? So those yeah, are experiments. Also in similar, uh, similar uh, context, like, so as you showed that uh, the, the planaria can uh, range from two millimeter size to two centimeter size. There's something which is kind of stopping that you have reached the maximum size. So don't grow. Yeah. yeah. Don't regenerate. Yeah. You're, you're right. I mean, uh, I, I really, that's, that's a beautiful question, Nitesh. I mean, um, I mean, I don't have the answers to that. Yeah, I don't have the answers. This is a beautiful question, actually. Those are those are burning questions in the field. Maybe those are like similar question towards the um, like cancer biology side. Maybe like yeah, 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 yeah. Well, what yeah. maintains the size, right? right? What maintains the size in the animal? I mean, what is what is telling the animal that it has to grow to the this particular size, right? So yeah, I mean, those are those are. I think those are those are, those are the questions that are still there, and people are trying to understand the answers to that, right? So uh, that brings back to this uh, whole model systems. I mean, I mean, now, now I hope I have convinced the viewers that it is important to look into these model systems to understand the biological processes, right? I mean, uh, and, and what I try to bring out is the kind of questions that can be addressed by looking into the nature, right? Uh, the problem is, I mean, our understanding of biology is dictated very much by a very few model systems. I mean, it is very important that we explore nature to look at 
these model systems are to look at these animals that have evolved in a specific specific ecological niche in order to understand the biology at different levels so that's what i wanted to bring this out and that is what i learned uh by looking at planaria as a model system right so that's what i'm been doing so uh, yes. yeah go ahead yeah. Uh, at this uh, point we'll just take a brief detour to, to just yeah. talk about the people um right so we started off with Uh, well 2000 year old uh, uh, literature and then we talked about uh, thomas morgan and then alejandro yamanaka and all these um, uh, people who worked on these at different um, uh, levels um, and obviously this is something that's there for everyone to uh, see everyone will tell you that a lizard regenerates the tail an earthworm can um, uh, regenerate so um, so harini's question here is uh, who was the first want to discover regeneration i would say discover and document it in a yeah i mean the, the, do the we know that yeah i mean now uh, the documentation goes back to 1600s 1700s and and maybe way before that right um uh, so uh, so what i can do is uh, i have this old books that i can actually share on uh, ebooks with uh, harini which is a very interesting uh, illustration of uh, the historical perspective of uh, uh, of regeneration for instance there were a lot of studies before uh, were done on hydra in terms of uh, understanding regeneration the person called trembley and all that they have this beautiful pictorial representations of uh, hydra regeneration right and and there are the regeneration has been uh, has been historically fascinating humans for a very long time so there were a lot of documentation about regeneration coming from the old times right so i mean i'll be very happy to share the uh, uh, links right i mean in fact i will gift harini that book yeah yeah das if you can also send the link to niti she can put it in the description in the youtube video as well for people i i I, I will do that i will i'll do that um, i will do that i mean i, I don't I have now i will do that i'll i'll yeah. send it to niti right so i mean i'll quickly very quickly take you through this hydra i mean uh, if i don't bring so that's one more question on the people this is this question came very very early actually so i've been holding it for a long time so it's asking about uh, scientists working on these models today um, where do we find the patients to look at this thing which takes which can take forever to regenerate some organisms i guess so how how do we uh, 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 scientists working on these kinds of things deal with the time aspect of this i mean hydra takes 7 days or maybe a little more and and sorry not hydra sorry planaria takes 7 days and a little more hydra literally takes 48 hours to a uh, little more so 48 hours is 2 days we are looking at right I mean, if we broadly expand it to development itself right yeah. <laughs> it so, i mean it takes forever nature nature yeah i mean if you broadly expand it to development yes it takes forever i agree with that so basically it's the same pathways and programs that are being used uh in the context of regeneration which has been used uh during development as i said developmentally they are very programmed in regeneration it has to reprogram as the as the necessity kicks in right and this animals regenerate at a very fast time scales so uh, so that i mean if if we now imagine if planaria takes one year to regenerate um, i would seriously would have not worked on that model right i would have looked at that model and looked at how it regenerate but i would have not worked because i can't um, set up regeneration and wait for a year uh, for it to regenerate the speed at which they regenerate makes them the most fascinating model systems to look at right so that's the answer for that so uh, surendra has uh, put in a point on the uh, uh, on the history of this region race so abraham trembley hydra yes. regeneration I mean, published in 1744 1740 i mean suren i mean uh, i mean uh, i mean professor suren gaskadbe is from agarkar institute and he he established uh, hydra research in uh, india and uh, he's again uh, he's a pleasure to talk to i mean uh, in fact uh, if i would have known i would have requested ashwin to uh, have him along with me on this uh, chat 
uh, that would have been fascinating because uh, he has way more interesting stories and he knows way more than what I know. So, uh, so yes, I agree with him, and uh, and th that's the literature that goes back. In fact, I mean, uh, I would actually request him to send some of the literature to Nitesh, uh, who can actually post it over the uh, website, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that brings us to this model system. I'll quickly take you through this model system. I mean, one aspect. I mean, again, like any other uh, model systems. I mean, all again, uh, the slides I'm showing. The couple of slides are gifted to me from Surin, uh, so thanks to him. So uh, the, the Hydra, like Hydra is a diploblastic, right? It's not uh, three layers, it's two layers, and it's radially symmetrical, right? It's not bilaterally symmetrical, it's a radial symmetry. Uh, the symmetry is in one direction anyways. And again, you can take this animal and you can cut this animal into pieces and this each piece can regenerate back. But Hydra can do much more amazing things, which um, Planaria cannot do. You can take Hydra, dissociate them into cells, right? And you put the cells together. It can regenerate the whole Hydra back, right? I mean, I don't know whether we have time, Nitish. I can quickly show you the video or I can share the YouTube link to you and maybe you can put because we are running over the time now, right? So. I mean, I, I do this comparison. I, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how many of them have seen this movie called uh, Terminator 2. Uh, that, that was famous when I was a kid because um, there was this, this was man called Liquid Man, right? You blow this Liquid Man into pieces and this Liquid Man comes back. Uh, it's a Terminator 2 movie. It's on Netflix. Please watch it. It comes back and the whole man grows back, right? And then I started looking at this model and this model was introduced to me by, uh, by Yashoda who was in, at Instem and also by uh, Surain uh, whom I started interacting with. Um, so, uh, so similarly, you take this animal, you dissociate them into cells and put the cells together. You see this clump of cells grow back into an hydra. When I just saw that under a microscope, I was thinking, wow, man, <laughs> what amazing things nature can do, right? These cells have ectoderm and endoderm. They have an outer layer, they have an inner layer. When you dissociate the cells and reassociate them to make an hydra, the ectoderm goes to ectoderm, or the outer layer goes to the outer layer, and the inner layer goes to the inner layer. So now, an interesting question, how does this animal know where it has to place its tissues, right? So that becomes, an, again, an interesting area to understand and do research. Again, the answer lies very much in the gradients which I spoke about and which uh, Ashwin brought out, right? So uh, there is another interesting organism. I want to leave it here, which uh, I and Ashwin stumbled upon. And in fact, Ashwin has sent his old book to me to read, and I was blown off and fascinated by that. This is a single cell. This is not a multicellular animal. This cell is called stentor. It's called as a trumpet animalicule. Because it's called trumpet, because it is in the shape of a trumpet, right? You can see the shape of a trumpet here. It's called a trumpet animalicule. And this can grow to the size of three millimeter. That means I said you can take a one centimeter planaria and starve it to one millimeter, right? That's a multicellular animal. This one cell can grow to the size of a starved planaria. Now, this is what is amazing. This is a single cell, guys, remember. Now you can take stentor and you, you cut the stentor or you cut one cell. That cell somehow heals and grows back to the size. I know that is your particular time, but I would like to show this video, man. I mean... <laughs> So I need to share it back. I need to come out and share this back. Uh, I, I think so. Thus, you'll have to open that and then share that. Video. So I, I'm mostly done here. I will stop the sharing here. And maybe, uh, I mean, if I will be doing a grave injustice if I don't show that video. Uh, I just feel that people should see that video. Let me work on that. Uh, let me bring that video out. Uh, where is that? A lot of things open on my desktop. Just give me one minute. 
So Das, while you are at it, I'll prime you with uh, one more question that we have from Sharvari. Uh, do we know of any mechanical yeah. gradients apart from uh, chemical gradients? Yes, sorry. I mean, I think, I, in fact, the video I wanted, that's a beautiful question. That's a beautiful question. In fact, what I wanted to show from Hydra is the mechanical gradient part. There is this beautiful work that was published in Cell Reports where they have shown that how an acting uh, and myosin cytoskeletal structures, the, the actin myosins are these thread like elastic thread like structures um, that actually help to maintain the size and shapes. So, this kind of structures are very critical to drive regeneration process, right? Yes, in a nutshell, uh, the mechanical forces indeed add value in terms of regeneration. In fact, uh, they are also one of the major drivers of regeneration to my understanding, okay? So I'll just sh uh, show this video of Stenter. Can, uh, can you see Nitish? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is, a, this is you guys remember that uh, trumpet animalicule, right? It's a trumpet shaped, the single cell. So they have already cut the, the, the single cell at the tip, right? And now what you will see is the regeneration aspect of it. And when you can see how the cell is growing back to its size, it has been cut at the tip and the tip is now, it got closed and it is growing back into the whole cell. And this cell grow, can grow to the size of around two millimeter. Now imagine I am taking one cell and I'm cutting the cell. The inside of the cell should come out but it doesn't happen so, right? So what the cell has to do is it's, it has to prevent the inside, heal it off and grow back to a one millimeter cell size, right? And imagine what you can learn both in the terms of cell biology and the regeneration from the single animal, right? And it is actually worthy to look into this model systems to understand how and, and, and another interesting aspect here, you can see that it's a trumpet, right? One side it is narrower and other side it's broad. That means there is a polarity in the animal, in, in the cell. So now the question comes is, how is this polarity being maintained, right? So that makes it a very interesting aspect to study again, right? So, uh, I mean, we haven't- I have this question for you. What do you mean by learning public speaking skills? What is that? Does this mean that we have to learn? I more? think that's it's ah, sorry, sorry, it's sorry. Yeah, yeah, I turned autoplay. It. Yeah, I turned it off. I turned it off. It's an autoplay. Yeah, sorry for that. So, uh, so basically, what I'm trying to show here is uh, this animal, the single cells can do these amazing things, right? In terms of understanding how these processes are driven, right? So, uh, and and again, I mean, that's another interesting area to understand and learn. So that brings back to how we can explore these model systems in order to understand how the processes of regeneration are driven. And every model system adds a value in terms of understanding a specific biological questions, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I know we have went over the board. Uh, so uh, it's a great, great talking. I mean, I, I'm happy to take questions. No, there's still this one early question, which I thought we'll reserve for the end. Yeah. Um, is uh, again from Sharvari. She's asking, what are your thoughts on the future of regenerative medicine? You're at Instem, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. I mean, I want to stick to invertebrate models, but let me say that. I mean, uh, there is. A, I just want to quickly share uh, uh, my slide here. Um, I mean, I mean, what what these animals do in terms of regeneration? whether taking a stem cell and making into whatever tissue types. Are, are if you look at and model systems like salamander where they can take a cut limb and the terminally differentiated cells can de-differentiate back and make new structures, right? So what does, does model systems tell is the capacity to take a differentiated cell and de-differentiate it back and make into a cell type that you want. That process is called reprogramming and which has been beautifully shown uh, by Yamanaka for which he got a Nobel Prize, right? 
So uh, that's where we are going in terms of um, regenerative medicine. Oops, what happened? Yeah. Can you see this? Uh, yes. Yeah. So this is this we call it as induced pluripotent stem cells. They're called iPSCs, right? And 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 uh, this our, our stem cell institute is heavily invested uh, in this kind of a research here. So basically, what does this do is you can take any cell type. You can take a fibroblast, or you can take a skin cell, or you can take a blood cell, uh, and then you can you can reprogram the cell to make it pluripotent. So when you make it into pluripotent, that means this cell has a capacity to regenerate back into any cell type or differentiate into any cell type. So now look at the use of this, right? Uh, now you have a patient say with uh, some disorder, you can take his cell, you can uh, grow the tissue you wanted from that cell, you correct the disease, right? Hypothetically, hypothetically, you can put it back. Putting back is still very difficult, but you can model the disease in the plate, right? So for example, can I model a disease in a mouse and understand how human disease prognosis happens or how progression of human disease happens? Mouse has its own limitation. What this IPS technology or induced pluripotent technology gave us is it helped us to model diseases inside a plate, right? So that's where the field is going towards uh, in terms of uh, generating iPSC lines um, to make uh, whatever tissue type we want so that we can model the diseases in the plate. So that's where uh, the future is. Uh, and uh, I think uh, INSTEM as an institute has heavily in invested in terms of understanding uh, these processes, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Any yeah. more questions? Ashwin, do we have questions? Yeah, so, uh, well, we have uh, uh, on a lighter vein, um, uh, Harini is generally quite obsessed with uh, poisonous beings and she hopes that uh, animals which carry poison cannot regenerate. Okay. Because hopefully they have other methods to protect themselves, so they don't need regeneration to protect. That's a very interesting thought. That's a very, very interesting thought. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, uh, see, the, the word poison is very relative, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, I think it's a very interesting thought. It's a very interesting thought. I mean, uh, one way, I mean, as uh, Nitish pointed out, what is this? advantage that these planarians get by regeneration, right? If they are cut by mistake, they can regenerate. Back. And if they are eaten by a prey, if a part was cut off by a prey, they can regenerate back. But in, a, in animals that can actually make uh, toxic chemicals, they can actually ripple away the preys from attacking. So maybe they don't need, but, but, but jellyfish is an example, and jellyfish regenerates, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting thought. It's a very, very interesting thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. there are a few more questions at a very detailed mechanistic level that I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, we probably don't have uh, time. I think yeah. there's uh, one on I mean, transitions, regulatory networks. Oh boy, yeah, uh, yeah, that's. I, I mean, that 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 requires much more serious uh, discussions, actually. Yeah. I, I believe this is not the forum, but 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 I just want to tell that uh, there is a lot of literature on planaria. There are a lot of reviews that are there on planaria, and uh, I strongly suggest people to uh, read those reviews. They are beautifully written reviews, uh, which will address some of these gene regulatory networks and other kind of questions that are popping, right? So uh, I strongly recommend and I can share, uh, I mean, uh, uh, maybe they can also, I mean, they can look at my uh, email ID, they can email me and I can, I'll be happy to share the reviews on the right? Yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Surendra has uh, uh, commented in the uh, live chat 
saying that one school of thought is uh, regenerative events can sometime lead to cancer if control of the proliferation is lost. So this may be the reason for reduced regeneration capacity in uh, complex organisms. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to, just to, I mean, I agree with Suren on that, but other interesting aspect is uh, these animals undergo extensive regeneration, but they don't make any cancers, right? So these animals have built-in capacity to resist the cancer formation. So uh, then the question also comes is, why did we lose it? Because we also age, right? The cancer is an age-related disease. Um, so we age, that leads to mutations, that leads to cancer formation. So, but somehow this animals has the capacity to resist it. That's another interesting area, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So uh, we should uh, end the session and uh, we thank you, Das, and thank you. Uh, like for giving this like a proper end to this uh, series in our in this year. And it was like too much interactive session and great session for us. Yeah, I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed. I mean, I have to tell you both Nitish and Ashwin, you guys are doing a great job. I mean, uh, I, I think we should uh, uh, keep this up and we should, I mean, you guys should take it forward. And uh, it's a great initiative and I really appreciate it. I really, really appreciate the initiative you guys have taken. And this is one way to actually uh, show the community what kind of research that can happen and why such kind of research is very important, right? And, and one of the biggest, I'm the biggest proponent of looking into model systems, right? Because there's a lot of biology you can learn by looking into model systems. Yes. So I think your initiative is actually doing that. And, and, and three cheers to you and Ashwin for that. Thank you very much. We'll be back in 2021. You should call it season two. Season two, yeah. Season two. <laughs> Season two. And then and, and then and then and then maybe I mean I, I think you should really get a list of people onto the board. I mean they're very, very interesting people working on interesting model systems who can come and talk to you guys. Yeah, a few are obviously busy with their COVID research and they said they will just ping me as soon as they're done with that and they can they have the time. I mean it's a time we move, it's a time we move beyond that now, right? And so, great. Great, great. so yeah, so I'll just thank you all for joining us today and it was like great and short and uh, definitely uh, without your questions, this session would not have been like this much. True, true. And, uh, and so as Ashwin says that this was season one and we have completed seven uh, sessions starting from bacteria to fungi we even uh, talked about brain, how brain controls uh, um, big organisms. And now we are ending with uh, fascinating organisms like planaria. So for me, who is in charge of uh, audience questions, this was a little difficult. Uh, we've never seen such a stream of questions coming through. I hope I did a decent <laughs> uh, job yeah. covering as much as uh, was yeah. possible. So uh, I thank know, you for I, getting keeping the questions. I, I want to thank all the viewers. I mean, uh, amazing questions, amazing questions. And I want to really thank all the viewers uh, for their questions. Thank you very much. And thanks to you both. Yeah. Thank yeah. you all. And uh, yeah, as I always say, please like, share, subscribe our videos and uh, uh, try like join our uh, outreach initiative just by sharing these videos to uh, science enthusiasts out there. And uh, so we will take off uh, this year and maybe we'll come back soon in 2021. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you guys. See and you. Happy New Year. And happy New Year. Yeah. Yeah. See you. And stay safe. Bye.